Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Joe. Bill, Kay, Kevin, Nicholas, Fernando, Sean Paul, Michael, Howard, Hector, Kevin, Vince, David, Peyton, David, Steve, Peter, Robin, Greg, Hard, Lee, Dan, Jim, Richard, Roger, Mark, Paul, George, Snake, Marty, Mike, Mike. And Roger. <laughs> the other Roger, apparently there's, a, there's also a Roger over there. Okay, fine. Uh, it's an unusual name. If you're enlightened, uh, uh, now you could go back and repeat all the names. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is uh, Roger Hector Kevin Nicholas Fernando Sean Paul Michael Howard Hector Moving around a bit so that I can see uh, see people. Um, this a microphone is just to record uh, the tape. It doesn't actually amplify anything. So if uh, you can't hear me uh, clearly, uh, please um, uh, uh, wave a limb or something and let me know. If you can't hear me uh, at all, of course, then you won't even know. But, uh, uh, <laughs> Presumably you'll hear something. Um, right. What I'm going to try to do is uh, base my talk on um, an article I published uh, some years ago uh, called Self-Power Practice with Other Power Attitude. And it was done specifically for a journal uh, of the Jodha Shinshu tradition, the uh, Pure Land tradition that is the most popular in uh, Japan. When, in fact, the, the, the Buddhist tradition that's the most popular in Japan and is, uh, has its presence on the West Coast here as the BCA, or the Buddhist Churches of America. Uh, the headquarters are uh, 1750 Octavia Street between Pine and Bush. And there's a bookstore there, actually. Uh, this is not exactly a commercial. I don't get any um, commission from this. But there is a, there is a bookstore, uh, which is difficult to know about because uh, you have to see that there's a note on the door, then you have to go in and push the button, and, they, and then they buzz you in if they happen to be there. And if it's lunch, they might not be. But it is one of the better bookstores in the, in, in the area for Buddhism, and particularly, of course, for the Jodha Shinshu tradition. Could you say the address again, Roger? Uh, 1750 Octavia Street, between Pine and Bush, and it would be in the uh, phone book under Buddhist Bookstore. It's always a good idea to give them a call first to see if anybody's there, um, because they're rather short-staffed. And you'll probably be the only customer when you go there, so you can have a talk uh, to Catherine, who's now looking after it. She comes from Marin. Anyhow, that's just, um, by the way, this is to tell you that um, how, the, how this came to be. Uh, the Pure Land tradition is the most popular tradition of, uh, most popular practice of the Buddhist tradition in uh, East Asia, and it is certainly not unknown in the Tibetan tradition, although it's not quite as um, prominent. Uh, it's not known in uh, Theravada, 
but I would say that if you were to count uh, noses, and in Asia they tend to count noses more than heads, um, uh, the most n- number of practitioners of the Buddhist tradition would be those who, who uh, recite the name of Amida Buddha. Namo Tofo, Namo Amida Butsu, uh, and, and its, its, its variants, and uh, they will tell you they are relying on the power of the Buddha to liberate them. They're not relying on their own power to liberate themselves. And when people in the West who have had some contact with, with Buddhism, when they hear this, they're often quite shocked and say, it sounds like it's a god, it sounds like the, the Buddha is a god and they're Christians um, and there's something wrong with this, it's not real Buddhism. I've had, had quite a number of professional articles have said, is Pure Land Buddhism really Buddhism? Well, if it isn't, there's not many Buddhists because, uh, as I say, the majority of Buddhists in, in East Asia, and that's the majority of, of, of Buddhists, Theravada Buddhism is not, uh, doesn't have as many people, um, are practicing this. Uh, so um, what I want to look at is the notion of self-power and other power. It's normally put in this dichotomy uh, are you saving yourself, or liberating yourself, or uh, is it the other power? And in general, it is the Pure Land B- Buddhists who put the other power thing as if, as if other power is what they're doing and self-power is what other, other Buddhists are, are, are doing. And that's a leg pull, really, as I will hope to show. It's something uh, that if you want to sell something, you know, you have to say why you're a model is better than somebody else's, and uh, then you ignore uh, anything which uh, might uh, uh, affect that in an adverse kind of way, uh, so that you wouldn't wouldn't buy their particular product. Uh, so I want I want to uh, look at with you this morning the uh, question of who, as Paul said, who is doing it. Uh, When we are doing sitting meditation, which is the principal thing that Western Buddhists like to do sitting. They don't like to say anything or chant anything or read anything uh, or even to do any ethical practice. They want to sit. Uh, That's what they've come for and they're not going to be deflected from that. We can have a bell, but that's about it. Uh, So what are we doing when we're doing that? Um, It would seem that maybe we're uh, sitting uh, all alone or we're sitting with others but we're not not talking to them, interacting with them uh, and we are trying very hard to purify our minds and stop our thoughts and be enlightened before... Uh, the end of the session, something like that. Uh, now, this is um, this uh, viewpoint is supported by uh, a, a translation of the uh, reported last words of the Buddha, which uh, I was talking to someone just before we walked in. They had read the same kind of thing, and I'd read it as a young man studying Buddhism for the first time, and it confused me. Uh, It is um, something like this, and I'm going to see if I can find the actual footnote, where um, uh, this is one of the classic translations uh, by Rhys Davids, who was uh, 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 the head of the Pali Tech Society, the, the founder indeed, um, a, a footnote, um, he married his graduate student, a, a woman of course that was, it was a woman, but anyhow this is one of the instances where uh, the professor and the student were able to get along all right uh, and it wasn't just a question of um, something that you shouldn't do. So anyhow, um, in that case it worked. So in this 
in uh, the Dika Nikaya, uh, where the Buddha is, is passing off, uh, just about to pass into Nirvana, Rhys Davis translates the Buddha as saying, Therefore, O Ananda, Ananda is the uh, closest disciple of the Buddha, I would say, not, not the chief really, but um, the one who was always around, uh, his uh, uh, constant attendant, so he's telling him something uh, personal. Uh, Therefore, O Ananda, be ye lamps unto yourselves, be ye a refuge to yourselves, betake yourselves to no external refuge, hold fast to the truth, as to say the Dhamma, or the teaching of the Buddha, as a lamp, hold fast as a refuge to the truth. Uh, now, if you don't read this carefully, I mean, the translation is all right, but if you don't read it carefully, it sounds like um, you're on your own, kids. Uh, the Buddha's leaving now, and so I'm all right, Jack, and I'm going to push off and leave, and you've got to work it out on your own. Um, work out your own salvation uh, with diligence is what I was I was told. Uh, Rhys David, however, is is more careful than that. He's translating into English y y using a kind of fake 16th century English, which was the way you had to do sacred texts in those days. Uh, the Buddhist texts were thought to be uh, something like the Bible. So you, and in those days, the only version of the Bible that English-speaking people read was written in was done in the 16th uh, in in the 16th century, um, and so it had uh, it had that kind of English in. So ye is not the. You see, it says ye. Uh, in 16th century English, a distinction was made between you and uh, uh, you all, you see, y'all, as we'd say in the South, between y'all and you, uh, an individual. Uh, some Quakers in, uh, in, in, in New England will still address each other as a the in the individual because they feel it is improper to use the plural form for a single individual. So what we're being told here by the Buddha is uh, we have the three refuges the tr or the triple refuge because the three refuges interpenetrate. Everything in Buddhism interpenetrates with everything. So if you, if you start anywhere, you've got the whole thing. And it, will, it doesn't matter really in Buddhism where you start because it's all connected. You start in the place that seems most uh, helpful to you and then it, it, and you move out from there. So the, th the, uh, the triple refuge or the three refuges are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Uh, the Buddha uh, obviously is, um, first of all, an individual. It's actually much more than that in the, in, in, uh, the high teaching, but it first of all uh, refers to an individual who lived in a certain historical place and time, uh, a certain historical time, a certain geographical uh, place, and is therefore called the historical a Buddha, or as I would prefer to say, the Buddha for our uh, continuum, because uh, uh, Cartesian space-time is a construction uh, which we find uh, almost an inescapable thing. We seem to be trapped in Cartesian space-time, but it's a construction. It's not what the universe is really all about. So that is the individual who is then the teacher. And the Buddha as the teacher is teaching the Dhamma or Dharma, Dhamma in Pali or Dharma in Sanskrit and then uh, other, other translations in other languages, but uh, I prefer to keep it as the word Dharma rather than, say, the law. Uh, it's sometimes translated as the, as the law. That's because in Chinese they said Fa, and one of the meanings of the word Fa in Chinese is law. Uh, uh, somebody was reading something on the part when they're coming over in big letters, FEFA, which means something against the law. So um, it's, uh, but that's the least 
obvious meaning of it in Buddhism. It means the order of the world, something like that, the, the, the way things are. Uh, so the truth is a fairly good translation of the word dharma. Um, the Buddha is reported as, as, uh, as, uh, as saying, one who sees uh, me sees the dharma. And one who sees or hears the dharma hears or sees uh, me. Uh, the Buddha is one whose actions of body, speech and mind are entirely in accord with uh, the way things are, with the way re reality is. Um, he walks the talk, uh, what you see is what you get, a whizzy wig, uh, that kind of thing. So that's uh, which, uh, which is different from the way m most of us uh, go about it, especially professors um, who say one thing and do another, uh, uh, because we're often not uh, unified or identified uh, with what we're teaching. We're not our teaching. A, pr a professor is teaching about a subject, uh, but uh, a teacher of the Dharma, a Dharma teacher, uh, as much as he or she can possibly be, is the teaching. And you watch what the Dharma teacher is, do, is, is, is doing in practice of body, speech, and mind, and say, I want that kind of thing, and that's what the Dharma is all about. If the Dharma teacher is not in accord with his or her um, teachings, you say, well, I'll take what they what they say, but they're not really going to be my teacher in, in, in full. They're not up to that. Um, so then the Sangha, uh, the third one, uh, third of the refuges, is uh, the community. Uh, this is the yourselves of the be refuges unto yourselves. Uh, the com com community of the followers Sangha means those who come together, uh, sometimes called ganna or flock, uh, something that happens all the time in India. If you ever go to India and, and uh, you're going about with a suitcase or two, you can, a, a whole lot of people come and they want to help you with the suitcase. So you're always surrounded by, by people. And, of course, the, the Buddha was surrounded by uh, followers to whom he then entrusted uh, the Dharma. So, what all that is happening, uh, it's, uh, it's a big thing, but it's not a, a big break in many ways, is that the Buddha is disappearing. According to the early tradition, the Buddha disappears into final nirvana and is not able to be accessed directly. Uh, the Mahayana doesn't agree with that, but let's, let's keep one thing at a time. In, in the early tradition, the Buddha disappears into the non-phenomenal and says, I'm not going to be around. So, you can, but you can still have the Dhamma, the Dharma, the teaching, which is the same as me, and the community, which is uh, preserving as best as it can the, uh, the teaching. The uh, community is charged with the preservation of the teaching of the Buddha and passing it down in the, in the, in the tradition, which is why a person who is an official Dharma teacher is ordained by somebody else who is an official Dharma teacher, and in theory it goes back to the Buddha. Uh, every official Dharma teacher has some kind of a document which is supposed to take him back to take her, him or her back to the Buddha. Um, so, w where is the individual in this? The individual is a part of the community. We, are, uh, uh, we don't have the Buddha around uh, in a physical sense today. We have a, we have a statue, but that's as far as we can get. Um, but then. Uh, we have the Dharma and we have the Sangha, we have all of us, and uh, we are taking refuge in that. We're not taking refuge in our own, uh, uh, our own uh, mind, which is confused mind. Why should we do that? We just, uh, that's, that's not going to help. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, the, that's uh, 
I think if you just get that, if you just take that away from, from this morning's talk, it will be um, uh, enough. But it does go on from, the, from there. And it starts to look a little like Christianity. Uh, don't worry, it isn't. Um, I know a lot of people come in to Buddhism because they've been hurt by the Christian tradition. Uh, for some reason, uh, if you're Jewish, it doesn't seem to affect you as much. People come in from Judaism and they, they find it's okay and they can be Jubus, as they say. Uh, but <laughs> Christians... Um, <laughs> If you, if you come in from the Christian thing, you know, Christianity, get rid of that, and, and, and they don't, anything that looks like Christianity in, in, in Buddhism, there is no, there isn't anything in Buddhism that I've been able to f f find, and I've been st studying this since I was about 16 years old, and I'm now 64. I found nothing in Buddhism that is precisely the same as the god of the Abrahamic traditions. Um, there's no, there's, uh, uh, specifically, there's n nobody in Buddhism whom you can blame for the way things are. You see, when you have a, the, the, the God of the Abrahamic traditions did, is responsible for making the world, and we can certainly, it's certainly legitimate to ask, why did you make such a, a bad job of it? And there's a whole area of theology, theological writing in Judaism, Christianity and Islam that addresses this. It's not an issue that they've missed. They, they, they're, they're very interested in this and they write about it a lot. But in Buddhism we don't have to ask that. Who is responsible for the world? We are. Who made, who made this mess? We made it. The Buddhas come along and help us to get out of it. But they do come along and they do affect us in uh, some way that is similar to that of uh, the God of the Abrahamic traditions coming in and saving or liberating us. So that's where it seems to be the same, but it's not the same, all right? So um, don't get too upset if it sounds to be Christian, because, as I say, it isn't. Uh, so um, one of the most important of the texts uh, in this regard in uh, uh, the Mahayana, and I'm going to concentrate mostly on uh, uh, the, the Mahayana now, uh, in Theravada we uh, just have the three refuges which still gives us a feeling that we're not doing it on our own. This is not, we're doing it with the support of uh, the Sangha and of of the Dhamma, which uh, uh, we do hear about, but in Theravada, the Dhamma remains more or less a teaching, although it's slightly more than that. Because in the popular, in the in a, a Buddhism as practice, I want to say, I don't want to say popular Buddhism because that means there's, there's popular Buddhism and there's the unpopular Buddhism of the professors <laughs> or something. But in 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 Buddhism as practice. People in Theravada countries will sometimes say, conclude a letter in the Dhamma or go with Dhamma. So it's doing something. Um, now in the Mahayana, uh, this becomes uh, more of a, a cosmological principle, we might say. And the text that is the most interesting for this perhaps is called The Awakening of a Faith in of the Mahayana, a treatise on the awakening of faith in the Mahayana. This is supposedly written in Sanskrit by Ashvagosha, a, a very well-known uh, early teacher, uh, but it really couldn't be. It's much too short. Um, it's very short, concise, to the point. Um, and it seems to have been written more than spoken. In India, even when the sutras are written, they were first of all spoken, and in an oral tradition you go on about this and that and keep on going, and you go round about and say once again the same thing and go on for hours, and it goes on for pages, and you've said two or three things. <laughs> and when, the, when this came over, over to, to, in, in, into China, the Chinese were... Um, amazed and appalled. There was too much stuff. There was so much writing. They had the four books 
They had just uh, they can go into into in, in, if it's written in the Ch- Chinese, it's about this thick, um, um, and that's all it is. And then they had these immense texts, and they said, compared with uh, our own Confucius and our own Lao Tzu, the Buddha's teaching is like a vast ocean, and we're like just. Uh, small ponds, little ponds we, and we're, we're lost in all of this so uh, some people came along and said well let's see what's the essence of all of this uh, whereas uh, Indian culture uh, culture in the is really good about expanding and seeing things from this aspect and that aspect and, and, and seeing it as a kind of it seems to me that Indian philosophy is always something on the move. It's always, it's always moving and changing and, and it's got different facets here and there and everywhere and you're inside it and it's inside you and um, it's constantly en- being en- 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 enriched from different perspe- by different perspectives. And the Chinese, um, when they're at their best, um, uh, tend to be very good at getting the summary, getting the essence of the thing. What is, um, what is the heart of all of this? And uh, what's the main thing that we should know about? For instance, a book that you probably all looked at in English, uh, uh, the Tao Te Ching, uh, it looks like the Teo Te Ching, actually, in English, but that's not how you pronounce it. Um, that, uh, that's been trans- 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 translated into, um, uh, um, in English, umpteen times. Um, it begins, at least in the text that we normally re- read. There's a new, there's a, been a different text discovered now, which is, um, has the has the has the, the, the volumes reversed. But it begins with the word Tao, and it said that if you can understand the word Tao, you don't need to go on. You've got the entire book. But if you haven't got it, well, you go on and read the first uh, chapter. If you still haven't got it, you read the second chapter, and eventually you get to the end, and then you understand the first word, and then it all comes together as that. So, in a sense, something like this was happening with the Da Teng Chi Sing Lun, which is the only way you can call it that, because it wasn't written in the Sanskrit. People give it a Sanskrit uh, uh, title, but it's just because uh, it looks better. If you call it Mahayana, Shraddhapada Shastra, it looks much more learned, because uh, who else could have thought how to translate Chinese back into Sanskrit but a a professor, right? (laughs) Um, So um, it looks at the problem like this. Here we are uh, unenlightened. Our minds are a mush, as they used to say on that... uh, 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 there was a, a TV show about people becoming lawyers uh, years ago. Uh, some of you who are uh, about my age might know that. And it would say, your minds are a mush, he would say it there. And, and he's here to make you understand things. So our minds are um, confused. Uh, ignorance is pervasive. Uh, and if you have a dirty water, how can you purify the water with its own dirt. How do you, how do you if you're starting off with uh, uh, dirty water, with ignorance, how can you purify it? How is it even possible if, as the teaching of, uh, uh, most teaching of Buddhism says, ignorance is pervasive. Suffering, suffering and ignorance is pervasive. It's everywhere. So how, can, how comes it that we have the notion of enlightenment, even the idea that there's something else, where does that come from? Because it doesn't come from within the dirt, within, with, with, within the marsh. So the Awakening of Faith uh, uh, Treatise says it comes from the Dharma Dhatu, or the realm of the Dharma, which is in a sense different. Now it's not different in the sense of being up there, but it's a different might say a different way of looking at this. In a Buddhism, there's really nowhere to go. Um, this is all there is, but we're seeing it wrongly. Uh, so there's another kind of aspect of this re- reality, which is a pure. And it's 
connected with our reality by what the text calls perfuming. Um, and it says it's like the perfuming of clothes. If you put on, this was of course before soap, you know, and before soap you had to perfume stuff a lot. So uh, when you put on a garment, an expensive gar garment, it's got a perfume in, and then you're, the perfume came from outside and you think of the person who put the perfume in. Um, so I think it uses this word perfuming because it wants to talk, it wants to have a word that's about influence and setting up the conditions rather than causing and forcing something to happen, forcing its way in. So if we have a perfume, we're influenced by the perfume, but we don't have to go along with it. But we might say, that's a great perfume, where does it come from? And so we seek, we seek for the source of that uh, per perfume. So the awakening of the faith, uh, in, in the treatise on the awakening of faith in the, the Mahayana, uh, has, has, has this an, 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 an analogy. Our, uh, we get in our confused and our muddied and suffering existence, we get the perfume of enlightenment or bliss uh, or clarity or kindness um, or wisdom and we don't really get hold of it, we get a suspicion that there's something it's coming from somewhere else where, and, and then I want to go and find that and then this is what impels us to go and listen to the Dharma because we hear that this comes from the Dharma and so what's happening is uh, the Dharma is coming towards us. In fact, the, the Awakening of the Faith Treatise says it mysteriously moves. Uh, the word mysterious in, in Chinese is, is a very mysterious word. It can be used to mean we don't know what happens, but we know that it does happen. You see, the, ult the essence of the Tao is mysterious. So who knows what that is. Um, so the, the, uh, <laughs> the Dharma Dhatu mysteriously moves towards us and then we respond to that um, and uh, if it didn't mysteriously move to us we wouldn't even know it was there uh, and this is even more obvious in the most uh, 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 the most straightforward and the most elementary teaching of the, uh, 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 the Mahayana uh, um, which is all over in all traditions and that is of the triple form or triple body of the Buddha. Um, this is taking, this is picking up on something that we find in the early tradition of, of Buddhism where the Buddha, as I've said, he says, one who sees me sees Dharma and one who sees Dharma sees, sees me. And the Mahayana said, well, let's take this seriously. Because apparently what was happening, some people were doing pr practice of meditation and they'd been told that the Buddha has disappeared into the non-phenomenal. But he was appearing to them in their meditations in, and it said it seems to be there, somehow is really there. What's going on with this? So it's presumed that this might be the origin of the rise of the of the Mahayana. We're still not sh sure yet. The, the origin of the, of the Mahayana is still being researched, still very uncertain, but it may have something to do with this notion that people were ha having experience of the Buddha who was supposedly disappeared. Uh, and the Lotus Sutra seems to be all about that, partly all about that uh, kind of thing. So um, then eventually over the centuries it developed into the idea that Buddha is not simply an individual. Buddha is uh, most obviously an individual who lives in historical time, but that, that person is an emanation of, a of what we call a divine, or uh, I'll call it, a, I'll call it a, div a, a divine body in the Buddhist sense of a divine body. Uh, it's, uh, it's enormous and full of light and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's many times bigger than the cosmic mountain. I call it divine because 
That's the form the Buddha takes to speak to the deities. Uh, deities are extremely handsome, and they're not going to listen to someone who stinks and has excrement like we do, and has to eat food and, and so forth, and have sex and all that. No, don't, no, don't have that. They, they're going to they're going to only listen to somebody who is a being of light. So the Buddha manifests as that. Even in the Pali scriptures, he manifests as that. So it's not just an invention of the uh, certain uh, or an idea of the uh, 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 Mahayana. There's some, I, some texts in the, in the Pali where the deities say, what's that light coming over the horizon? It must be a very big a deity. We've never known who is it. And it's the Buddha coming and he's bigger than all of them. He's be- better than all of, the, all of the deities. So it's called teacher of deities and humans. So uh, behind even that glorious form is a non-phenomenal form called the Dharmakaya or the body of the Dharma, body of the truth, body of reality. I don't know how to translate it. Um, uh, uh, Certainly it's not the body of the law, which is sometimes in the English, the law body, because it says fashion in Chinese, but that's not what it is. The body of the way things, it's the, it's the, embodiment or corpus of the way things are which is unmanifest and universal and has in its essence no marks or (laughs) uh, uh, no uh, qualities but it also has qualities when it it manifests and some early traditions the Dharmakaya itself has an unmanifest manifest form later on that's separated out into the Sambhogakaya, this big glorious form, which is the manifest thing. And what's going on here is the unmanifest form is wisdom. And the manifest forms are uh, compassion. The Buddha mind is always wisdom and compassion totally balanced. And I would say energy also from Tantra, but that's, uh, I, they don't often talk about that except within the Tantra. So definitely... Wisdom and compassion equally balanced. When we have total wisdom, we know everything, but we don't care. We don't give a damn. We know everything, and people are dying in their millions, and we just, uh, well, that's because of their fruiting of karma, you know. It's the way it is. But that's not the full Buddha mind. The Buddha mind is equally full of compassion. So as well as it sees all the suffering, it, it wants to help, and it does this automatically. It does it, as they say, spontaneously. There's, there's, there's Sanskrit, Tibetan, and Chinese words all meaning spontaneously. It's not that we think, oh, yes, these people are suffering, I should help them. It's said to be just the way a mother helps her only child. If a mother sees her only child going out into the traffic, she doesn't think, oh, dear, it's going to be hurt. Perhaps I should do something. Automatically she goes and helps it and thinks about it afterwards. So that's the way that the Buddha looks after all beings, just as a mother or parent looks after their only child. The Buddha sees all of us as his only child and automatically, spontaneously, without thinking about it, comes to help us. So the Dharmakaya spontaneously manifests as the Sambhogakaya, which spontaneously manifests as the Nirmanakaya, which is the human form of the Buddha. Um, so then we respond to the teaching of the Buddha and we're drawn into this so that we then eventually develop our own Sambhogakaya and the Dharmakaya in, in, in the Mahayana our enlightenment is when we attain to the Dharmakaya on our, on, on our own and then spontaneously produce the Sambhogakaya and Nirmanakaya so we, we attain to the non-phenomenal and spontaneously uh, come back into the phenomenal to help uh, all beings now this is true Obviously, for the Pure Land tradition, where they uh, uh, say that uh, we're going to emphasize this compassion aspect, uh, and uh, the Buddha Amida is what I would call the um, compassionate face or the personal face of the impersonal or wise Buddha mind, uh, and much easier to uh, 
get in touch with um, the wisdom thing, which is rather cold. I mean, if someone is extremely wise but very compa- not very compassionate, you don't ask them back to the party. Uh, <laughs> they're not very warm. Um, uh, so, but it's also true in the Zen tradition, uh, where some people uh, seem to think that it's only the wisdom. I think the wisdom is emphasized a little more in the Zen, but when you read the uh, 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 the really um, well, the really uh, high, I would call Zen masters, uh, such as Dogen uh, or Banke, they're not. Uh, saying we're doing it all ourselves. They're saying we are sitting because we are already Buddhas. And we are allowing our Buddha nature, which we already have, and we're allowing that to manifest itself. So it's a slightly different attitude, whereas in the Pure Land tradition, uh, there is a devotional or trusting attitude towards the B- Buddha who is pictured as being up, being different from us, although eventually we find that it really is the same as us. Uh, but in, a Zen, in the Zen tradition is the question of sitting there and allowing the Buddha mind to come out from within us, and then we realize we are the same as the Buddha mind. The, uh, the, the result is the same thing. So for your practice, um, you can, uh, you can adopt this and it might help you to be less, I mean, certainly help me to be less obsessive compulsive about it. Uh, as I was brought up in England after all, which means that you've got to do everything right. Um, and uh, I, I can now uh, re- relax a bit. It doesn't mean we do nothing. There's no Buddhist tradition that says, well, you do nothing and you do whatever comes up. So you feel like going into McDonald's and shooting everybody. That's the Buddha nature. Um, This is not the Buddha nature, (laughs) gentlemen. This is confused mind, very confused mind. Uh, What we need to do is still that confused mind. We have to work on, work on not doing. Really, that's what, that's what they're trying to say in all these traditions. There's nothing to do, which means we have to work on not doing. If we don't mess with it, the Buddha mind will appear of itself, and then automatically we will be wise and compassionate. And so then you will sit and say, I've got to sit, but I don't have to be enlightened. I just sit and I allow it to happen. And sometimes it's good to sit back and just relax, isn't it? Okay, thank you. Uh, any, uh, some, some, some time for questions, I think? Well, I'm going to ask you if you can stay afterwards and answer questions. All right. My uh, desk that keeps on schedule and it's noon, so we usually dissolve. So are you going to be sticking around? Uh, yes, okay, yes. Uh, also, Roger has a... Uh, 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 particularly for lunch, actually. I mean, if you're having you lunch, lunch, I'll come for lunch, yes. Roger, why don't you give your email address in case? It's in the newsletter. Is it in the newsletter? Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. If you give it right now, we could have it too. Well, it's um, the one that I, I, I give out peop- to people is the one that will always work. It, it's my, because um, it's, it's, the, it's the old Duke one that I have until I die. And if I change ISPs, you don't have to bother because it'll still be forwarded. So it's my name, which is spelled R-O-G-E-R, and then a dot, and then my last name, C-O-R-L-E-S-S, and then this at sign, and then Duke, D-U-K-E, and then dot E-D-U. So roger.callus at duke dot E-D-U will find me. Um, that's the best one to use in many ways because if I'm away, I can put a forwarding uh, or automatic vacation thing on that. And, and, and most of the time I use this thing called Juno, which is convenient because I had it and it's cheap, but it, I can't do things with it that I can't do with the other. So um, I don't, I'm not sure that I have a copy of this digital. I might still have if people want to have that. And I, I can, because I, I, when I moved out here, I... I had an old computer which we 
I suppose they put everything from the old one on the new one because the old one had a, a, a had like a one megabyte hard drive or something, you know. Now it has a 65 gigabyte or something, and so we just put it on and it lost there. So I could, probably could find it if you wanted a copy of this. It wouldn't have the kanji, the Chinese characters, but it would have the rest of it there. <laughs> but, but I'd like those if they work, yeah. Uh, afterwards, Paul will be gathering folks for lunch. I guess, Roger, you're going to join me. Yes, also. yes. And uh, if you have any questions about the, the Sangha, please feel free to approach me. Okay, and uh, what one I think. Oh, <laughs> So uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to start here in the building up um, a, a snail mail center. <laughs> and uh, you may have mail. And I also want to say that anyone who's uh, here today for the first time is welcome to take a recycled copy of the <coughs> talk before this, which is this month's newsletter, or anyone who didn't get their newsletter. It's the one on sex, isn't it? Yes. Yes, everyone wants that on sex. That's but I've, I, uh, I, I um, uh, have had about four or five people wanting the full text with all the footnotes, so that's good. What is this about uh, the mail? Do you, uh, you're collecting the mail, and what will this year write? Uh, yeah. oh. Well, I just put out mail. I mean, Don Newbert, for example, uh, anyone sitting in this week and takes in this stuff, they wish you. No so one takes it all, I'll send a snail mail. I see, I see. Some people write to the address. <coughs> Probably they just mail all of this. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks. We're closing the meeting. Uh, yeah, Lee, sorry. Uh, I just wanted just a brief announcement. The annual fall retreat is in two weeks. Uh, there are now 17 people that are going to be coming to it, which will be the largest in some years. Roger, Roger and I are coordinating it. Jim Wilson will be the teacher. Uh, it's at Bajrapani, which is a wonderful, wonderful place, very deep in the uh, in the redwoods and relatively inexpensive, uh, near Santa Cruz. Uh, I will be sending out the list of rides, people who want rides and can give rides and so forth later this week. Uh, and there is room if anybody else wants to come. Uh, there are still some forms outside there or contact me. And looking forward to seeing all of you. Joe. And a reminder that talks are available on the internet at the GBF website, gaybuddhist.org. Okay, do we finish up now? With, uh, we have David here. Okay. Oh. Yeah, on the 22nd of uh, September, we're going to be doing a, a triple refuge ceremony. And uh, actually, Paul and Roger are uh, assisting at that. And it's uh, really going to be great, but it does depend on you guys. Um, it's a community effort. So if you have uh, thoughts on, uh, a, you know, just a brief statement or a poem or something. 
short that you want to share on each of the subjects or any of them. Please bring it with you, um, or, or just speak spontaneously, or of course you can remain silent. Okay. So our custom now is to form a circle for the closing benediction. Do you want to uh, do that, or yeah. do you, uh, uh, do you want to? Otherwise, we can be. Do you want to do it, Doctor? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> What I say is my own uh, uh, adaptation of what are called the four immeasurables. May all beings be separated from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings be joined to happiness and the causes of happiness. May all beings dwell in equanimity with those who are near and those who are far. May all beings find peace, joy, and freedom. Please help by reading the uh, pillows. Thank you for the attention. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month, and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live. Please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.